All right, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, waking up bright and early this Wednesday morning. Um, KaiPak has had a wonderful uh, 10 years of great science and I expect more great science from you guys for the next 10 years. Uh, I also want to thank my uh, excellent collaborators, uh, at least for the particular work that I'm describing this morning. Pointer. Uh, Ed Brown, Stephen Gandolfi, Jim Latimer, Danny Page, and Madhapur Prakash. So my somewhat awkwardly, awkwardly worded title, How Neutron Stars, um, I wanted to emphasize that they really are going to answer questions about dense matter and QCD uh, and in, the, in the short near future. And so I want to talk about how neutron stars will, will tell us about dense matter. Um, so just to go ahead and dive right in, there are some basic neutron star questions, some fundamental things about neutron stars we, we're, we're learning about. One is that, that there is a mass radius curve, and we'd like to know how big neutron stars are. And uh, another question that comes up very frequently is what is the nature of dense matter? And so this comes up in a lot of sort of decadal surveys, and I'll talk a, a lot more about that. And of course, these basic neutron star questions are connected to fundamental nuclear physics questions. What is the nucleon-nucleon interaction? In particular, I'll talk about the nuclear symmetry energy, an important part of that. Um, what is the three neutron force? Also very interesting. And also, we're learning about QCD at finite density and low temperature. Um, in particular, about chiral symmetry and deconfinement. Um, just to go focus back on this question of dense matter, I think actually maybe this might not be exactly the correct question. Um, maybe one ought to think about the nature of dense matter in a slightly different way in the context of an effective field theory. And so now the question becomes, what are the relevant degrees of freedom? What are the low energy, energy degrees of freedom? And what is the correct effective field theory description of neutron star matter as a function of density at different locations in the neutron star? And then once we establish this low energy effective field theory, how do we compute the low energy constants? So I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later today. So, First, I want to just talk about this mass radius curve and uh, with regard to neutron stars. So here we have a summary picture for planets. So planets have varying compositions, and for that reason, they have different radii depending on the mass. Neutron stars are unlike planets in that they all lie on, they sort of form a family. They all lie to a good approximation on one universal mass versus radius curve. Okay, there are some corrections here for rotation, but generally these are smaller than the sort of other uncertainties we have currently. And so once you know this mass versus radius curve, if you ha also happen to measure the mass of a neutron star, then you can look down and you can figure out directly what its radius is. And then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this, mass, this universal mass versus radius curve and the equation of state of dense matter. This is sort of something you can think about. It's coming directly from QCD. So that if we know the mass versus radius curve, we can compute the equation of state. Or if we have a theoretical model of the equation of state, we can then compute the mass versus radius curve. Um, and so the idea generally is that if you have observations of neutron stars, mass and radius observations look like little dots, and you just connect the dots. And then I have a mass versus radius curve. I do the, the calculation, get the equation of state, and I've learned something about QCD. Um, so one of the exciting things is we've had some recent measurements of two, two, two solar mass neutron stars, and those effectively are vertical line constraint or horizontal line constraints, and that just means the curve has to go high enough, and that, that already is telling you something about uh, QCD. And neutron star radii are a little bit difficult. As of 2007, for example, neutron star radii lie between about 8 and 15 kilometers. And so you will see uh, that we can constrain that a little better now. And we're making real, really actually making progress on neutron star radii. Um, of course, the observational data isn't as neat and clean as just little dots that we can connect. Uh, it's a little, a little more uncertain. So here we have some mass and radius distributions for four particular neutron stars uh, inferred from photospheric radius expansion X-ray bursts. I'm not going to talk about the details of these observations, but just to say that these are sort of four, the neutron stars are four different colors, and I've sort of add, added them up. Uh, and then on the right-hand side here, I have mass and radius distribution mass and radius probability distributions from quiescent low mass X-ray binaries. And again, I've just added up the colors. And the basic takeaway point here is that you see that the radii, these probability distributions tend to clump near about 11 kilometers. And so that's basically the result we will find, except for there's a, little, a lot of quantitative analysis, some Bayesian analysis inside here to get that. Um, 
And I will confess, there are a lot of skeletons in my closet that I, I will not have time to explain to you. In particular, for example, you can think about distance measurements. Every time you have an uncertainty in the distance, that's directly proportional to uncertainty in the neutron star radius. And there are a lot of systematics in these distance measurements. Also, the shape and the time evolution of these X-ray spectra are all important. The hydrogen column density has become interesting recently. And so all, there's also these skeletons inside here, uh, and I won't ha unfortunately have the time to talk about it. In addition to masses and radii, I just wanted to point out there's a lot of other structural quantities about neutron stars which are interesting, which, which are connected at some level to this universal mass radius curve, in particular the moment of inertia or the tidal deformability, and also the nature of the neutron star crust. And so we would like to understand all of these things about neutron stars. Of course, now that I have all of this data, I can turn the crank, I can do the quantitative analysis, and I can come up with this universal mass versus radius curve. The observations are outlined in these funny black lines, but you see the colored region here is my curve, and you see that it's not a curve at all, it's in fact vertical. And what this means is to a relatively good approximation, all the neutron stars in the universe um, have the same radius. And this radius is between about 10 and a half and 13 kilometers. And then I can also, again, turn the crank and figure out what the equation of state is. And you see that here, these green and red regions outline the most probable equation of state from the neutron star mass and radius observations. And you see that there's some, uh, what I call a concordance, an agreement between the astronomical observations and nuclear physics. This is information inferred from intermediate energy heavy ion collisions. This is a theoretical model based on quantum Monte Carlo here in purple, and then some work from chiral effective field theory uh, in black, and you see that basically all of these things agree to some level. Um, it's important to note that I can determine the pressure of matter at some particular density, which is, of course, connected to QCD, but I can't tell you what provides that pressure. I can't tell you whether the neutron star is made of quarks or nucleons or um, purple horses. I, all I know is that they have a particular pressure. And so this is what's, uh, what's, what's going on. And I think the future of this will really, will really be in combining different kinds of observations. Here I've combined quiescent low mass X-ray binaries and photospheric radius expansion bursts. And I, what we want to do is combine all this information to really get a holistic picture of what neutron stars are like. I'm also learning a, little, a lot about the nucleon-nucleon interaction. This is sort of a fundamental thing in QCD. We'd like to know how neutrons and protons operate in nuclei. And one of the biggest uncertainties in the nucleon-nucleon interaction is called the nuclear symmetry energy. I'm going to explain what that is. So you can think here, this is the energy berberion. And now I'm just going to put, I have a box. I have a theoretical box. I put neutrons and protons in it. Um, and I just assume that matter is homogeneous, and I ask what is the energy per particle in that box? And that energy per particle is an equation of state, and it looks like this for equal numbers of neutrons and protons. This minimum here is just the phenomenon of nuclear saturation, the idea that the central densities of nuclei are effectively the same no matter how many nucleons are in the system. Now if I convert all those protons in the box to neutrons and I have a pure neutron matter, that is the new equation of state. And so the nuclear symmetry energy is just the difference between these two equations of state. It's a function which is zero at zero density and increases with increasing density, uh, at least for the sake of this talk. And so this, this uh, nuclear symmetry energy is just the energy cost for creating an isospin asymmetry. It says that I want to create a system with a different number of neutrons and protons, and for that I have to pay energy. And so that, that energy is the symmetry energy, which we denote as S. And then L is just this funny quantity which is related to the derivative of the symmetry energy. It tells you how quickly this energy cost uh, increases with density. And so here's an excellent summary plot given by my colleague Jim Latimer and Yen Wan Lim. And so you see that there's um, some information here. I won't explain all of these things, but just from nuclear physics and also astrophysics here that's converging. And so we're really learning about the S, which is here, which is just the magnitude of this function here at this special saturation density and then this quantity L, we're really learning about what these quantities are and this is, this is something about QCD. The, uh, the next thing I want to talk about here is actually in the, in the top part of this slide, I want to talk about three body forces. So because nucleons are composite objects, they're made of quarks, then there's a two body interaction but also a three body interaction. Um, in particular, there's a, there's a two-proton neutron force, or if you like, a two-neutron proton force, but there's also a three-neutron force, and that three-neutron force is not very well probed in nuclei because nuclei always have these protons hanging around. 
Fortunately, the neutron star is 90% neutrons, and so we can learn about this three neutron force, and one way of thinking about the equation of state of neutron star matter is just a, a set of two power laws, where one is the two-body interaction and the, the second power law is the three-body interaction. If you, if you analyze the neutron star mass and radius observations in this context, you, you do find that you get constraints on these. So the useful, the useful range of, for this parameter B is between 1 and 5 MeV, and you see that I'm ruling out the lower range in B. So the neutron star observations are really telling you about the three neutron force. Okay, now to talk a little bit more in detail about what the neutron star is like inside. On the surface, we ha just have normal laboratory nuclei. As the density increases, the, the, th these nuclei become more and more neutron rich, and eventually, so these nuclei form the crust, they form a, a Coulomb solid. Um, and then at some density, what happens is the, it becomes energetically favorable for some neutrons to leave the nucleus. And so they, these extra neutrons form a quasi-free neutron gas. And so these nuclei are embedded in this neutron gas. And then that is the region which we call the inner crust. And then again, at some higher density, about 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed, um, the heterogeneous nuclear structures, the surface energy becomes too, too great, and so you end up with homogeneous matter, which is just neutrons, protons, and electrons. And so that is the beginning of what we call the core of the neutron star, where we think of it just, just uh, a, a fluid, if you like, of, of neutrons, protons, and electrons. And then, of course, at the center, we really don't know exactly what's going on. There, what one usually hears is you can think about all sorts of things hyperons or Bose condensates or deconfined quark matter, but really what one is asking is what is the most what are the best low energy degrees of freedom that one ought to use to describe matter in the neutron star core, and we're still learning how to answer that question. Um, of course, as I mentioned, this is connected to QCD, and I just wanted to point out that, of course, neutrons and protons don't contain any strange quarks, okay? But all of the models basically to a good approximation, all models of neutron stars which don't have strange quarks have either one of two properties. Either they assume that a uh, priori that strange quarks aren't, uh, do not appear in neutron stars, or they're somehow finely tuned so that they push the strange quarks out. So this is something interesting and I think is, is certainly on the frontier. One of the fundamental parts about neutron stars I want to talk briefly about is superfluidity and superconductivity. Um, so any pair of Fermions, if they have some sort of some sort of attraction, will will form will have a, a, what we call a gap. They'll form a Cooper pair, and so when they form a Cooper pair, they gain a, a little bit of energy. This energy that they gain is referred to the energy gap. It's easiest to understand this in the form of looking at the dispersion relation. You think of normal fermions as just k squared over 2m, but now if you have this energy, if you have this attraction which creates this gap, there's, a, there's this little separation here at the Fermi energy, at this, at this Fermi surface, and this, Fermi, this, this separation is exactly this energy gap, this energy gain that you, that you uh, this energy that you gained when you formed the Cooper pair. And so because there are no states, because there's this there are no states with energy near the Fermi surface, this means that you can't, you can't scatter into any of these states because they're, they're separated. And this, this, this energy gap is exactly which gives you the low viscosity typified by superfluidity or the high conductivity from superconductivity. So this is just basically superconductivity is just when your two fermions, which are involved in this pairing, have some sort of electric charge and then you get, then you get superconductivity. And you, then you can see that the superfluidity is removed when the temperature is large enough to be able to move a fermion from here to here, then the, the superfluidity will be effectively destroyed because thermal fluctuations will, will override this gap. And so there is a critical temperature to this phase transition. And so if the temperature is above, then, then you have normal fermions, and when it's below, you have, you have superfluidity. Um, Superfluidity is ubiquitous in nature. Even neutrinos can be superfluid. They have a particular gap. And I will claim that if, you're, if your dark matter particle if, uh, happens to be a fermion, it will also have a superfluid gap if, it's, if it has some sort of attraction. And it's just a matter then of looking at that attraction and computing what that gap is and whether or not it happens to be relevant at the temperature you're thinking about. 
In a neutron star, superfluidity is also ubiquitous. There's um, neutron superfluidity and then proton superfluidity. And at high densities, you have this funny superfluidity where this Cooper pair is no longer in a spin anti-symmetric state, but a spin symmetric state. It's called uh, triplet, oops, triplet superfluidity here with the 3P2. So one of the interesting things about superfluidity, which I want to talk about, is it creates these new collective modes in the, in the context of the field theory. That these, these are the Goldstone modes created by the spontaneous symmetry breaking of the, of the gauge symmetry. But these, uh, but these collective modes are, are important for the neutron stars we'll talk about. I'll talk about here soon. Um, how am I doing on time? OK. So, these nuclei, which are in the neutron star crust, you remember I talked about the crust earlier. There's this lattice of nuclei, and they're embedded by this sea of quasi-free neutrons. These neutrons actually also are superfluid. And in fact, superfluidity is also an important part of the, of the structure of the nucleus itself. And so the question is, is how do you describe, how do I understand what neutron star crust matter is like, knowing that there are all these complications? And it turns out that one of the, one of the interesting, I think, um, sort of frontier ways to do this is to describe the neutron star crust as a low energy effective field theory. And so this is done here by Vincenzo Cirigliano and colleagues. And so then you have fields phi and psi, and it turns out that the, these fields phi are just exactly these Goldstone modes from the superfluid that I talked about earlier. And then, and these C fields are exactly the lattice phonons. And because, of course, they, they have a, a spatial index I corresponding to the three directions of the lattice. And so then you have uh, just a kinetic term. And then also you have the interaction terms. And these interactions correspond to the idea that the, the superfluid modes in the neutron superfluid can scatter off the lattice phonons. And so you have this interesting, complicated many-body many system. And then using this Lagrangian, you can understand the, the transport properties, the viscosity and the, uh, the neutrino opacity, the photon opacity, the thermal conductivity, if you like, in, in this neutron star crust system. And one of, the, one of the interesting things that has come up recently is this idea of entrainment. So that, uh, and this is, I think, I. Uh, I believe it was mentioned yesterday, but basically the, the, superfluidity, the superfluid neutrons, um, their, their motion is affected by the lattice. In particular, um, the, when the lattice moves, they drag some of the superfluid ne neutrons along with them. And so this has been uh, worked out a lot in Nicolas Chamel. And then uh, Niels Anderson and uh, Win Ho, who is also here, uh, have shown that this is really uh, very important for pulsar glitches. And so basically this is the first part in a long series of I will explain to you why superfluidity and superconductivity is really important for neutron star observables for things we can actually see. Um, of course, there's, there's also some, some relevance for neutron, uh, neutrino, yes, and photon opacities. So the typical way that a neutron star cools is just simply by beta decay. A neutron decays into a proton, electron, and neutrino. The neutrino leaves the star and takes energy away. But if these neutron and proton are paired, then in order to, to turn a neutron into a proton, you have to break a Cooper pair. And that breaking of the Cooper pair requires a, uh, you pay the energy gap. And so that's suppressed in the context of superfluidity. And so actually, superfluidity also creates new channels uh, of, of cooling, which can actually make the neutron star cool faster. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And of course, there's modifications to viscosity. You expect superfluidity to increase to uh, to decrease the viscosity and increase the conductivity. Now I'm going to connect this to real observations. So this is uh, the cooling curve. This is just a neutron star sitting out there. Its crust was heated up by accretion. The accretion shuts off, and then you can watch the crust cool. And this is the crust cooling. And you see that there's one power law here and the second power law here. And this, the fact that this second power law is steeper is because of the increased conductivity created by the neutron superfluid in the, in the neutron star crust. And so we're really seeing superfluidity, uh, which, is, which is connected to the nucleon-nucleon interaction in QCD. And we're really seeing this from an astronomical observation. Another example of this, uh, of super, superfluidity's importance, is in the observation of the neutron star inside Cas A. So this is also a cooling curve. Uh, here, the neutron, the, the neutron star isn't accreting. It's just sitting out there, and it cools as a function of time. And what we observe is this neutron star is cooling very fast. And this fast cooling 
can only occur because what's happening inside the neutron stars, those neutrons are going through this phase transition. Their temperature is higher than the gap, and then it's going lower than this critical temperature, and we're forming all of these Cooper pairs, and there's an exotic neutrino cooling process which creates this very fast cooling in this particular regime. And so the observations suggest, they tell you what the size of this gap is through this critical temperature. Um, also, there's, there's also this entrainment also affects, oh, thank you, five minutes. <clears throat> this entrainment also affects torsional modes. You will hear a, little, a lot about magnetars later. Um, magnetars have these giant flares. These giant flares are thought to be seismic events, and you're thinking about twisting the neutron star crust. If you're twisting the neutron star crust, then um, entrainment is also important in dictating um, what the frequency of these, of these modes are in the crust. And so this is a, a calculation uh, from earlier this year that we did that just shows that, that the mass and radius constraints you get out of, of these crustal oscillation modes depends on the amount of entrainment here, which is, which is just this is dimensionless parameter, which varies from a half to one. Um, finally, uh, that's, that's basically the end of all the superfluidity, but I also wanted to talk about the, sort of the composition and the core of the neutron star. So you can think about the sort of minimal model of the neutron star. If, if you like, the, the most naive picture is just the neutron star only consists of neutrons, protons, and electrons, and maybe there's some superfluidity, but there's nothing else. No strange quarks, no Bose condensates, no, no crazy dark matter or anything. And in that case, then, the neutron star, in the case of a neutron star which is cooling um, intermittently, it's cooling, or sorry, accreting intermittently, it's accreting with an average accretion rate given by m dot. And so you see this average accretion rate. So this is accretion, turns on and shuts off, it turns on and shuts off, but you can sort of time average this accretion rate. And that's on the, on the x-axis. And then the, the core, lumino the, the sort of quiescent luminosity of this neutron star is here on the y-axis. And so if the neutron star just consists of neutrons and protons, then you expect it to lie on this top curve here. That is that lower, lower accretion rates mean lower luminosities because it hasn't been heated up so much by the accretion. But you see that there's this one object, Sachs J1808, which is right here. It's very, very cold. We don't expect it to be that cold with this particular amount of accretion. And so what that su strongly suggests is there's something is exotic, some degrees of freedom in that neutron star that, that, we, that are not just neutrons and protons. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit more. Um, just this idea of an effective theory is, is very common. Also, it turns out hydrodynamics you can think of as an effective theory. Um, I think one of, the, one of the futures is uh, one of the frontiers of neutron star physics, for example, um, superfluidity. If you have a rotating superfluid, then you have all sorts of things going on, vortices and flux tubes, and also their interactions. I think effective theories of superfluid neutron star matter are really exciting. Um, and there's also lots of thinking about the right degrees of freedom is important. Thank you very much. Um, there are sort of large scale degrees of freedom in the neutron star, all sorts of torsional um, hydrodynamic modes, and also tidal deformation, sort of just normal oscillations of the neutron star as an object in and of itself. And so it's important to understand um, how, to, how to write these effective theories and how to compute the associated constants. So just to sort of uh, summarize at least the results part of this talk, I, current neutron star mass and radius observations are really telling us about this universal uh, or almost universal mass radius curve, all neutron star radii are between about 10 and a half and 13 kilometers, and this is just from the, just from uh, actual observations. And we're also learning about QCD. For example, this parameter, the symmetry energy, L is between about 35 and 80 MeV, and that's actually ruling out models which nuclear physicists use. And I have to, I have to tell them, no, you can't use this interaction anymore. It's really ruled out by neutron stars. Um, so, and we're also learning about superfluidity, exotic sort of quantum many-body physics inside these astrophysical objects. And in particular, we're learning about this, this triplet gap from, from the observation of Cas A. And of course, we're still trying to understand, well, we're, well, we can answer, we can now answer this question of what is the mass radius curve. 
We cannot yet answer the question of what's, what's inside the neutron star, what is the proper low energy effective theory. Um, and so finally, for the last slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the frontiers in neutron star physics. There's a lot left to do. Um, there's all sorts of neutron star physics that we don't understand, and all of these neutron star physics elements are connected to, to astronomical observations, things we can actually test uh, if we have enough, enough money and uh, in the, in enough data in the future. Um, we'd like to get, of course, I told you that the radius is in a particular range. We'd like to understand that even better. If we can really pin down the radius of a neutron star, we can learn uh, also about strong field GR, and these kinds of things. We'd like to know um, how neutron star masses, what the neutron star mass distribution is like, and how does that mass distribution evolve in the sort of when the neutron star is born, when it's accreting, as it, as it goes through its various life cycles. Of course, we'll hear more, I expect, today about the magnetic field strength and uh, the geometry and evolution. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, s several other things here. Um, that I've talked about. Just to final, uh, final notes, I think we really need close interaction between data and theory. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't happen as much as it ought to, and we really need to pay attention to our systematic uncertainties. The distance observations is really important. Um, I'm a uh, big fan of open source computational tools. I think our field will be improved by that, and I think computation is enabling uh, new approaches to old problems. So thank you very much for your time. Hi. Uh, as you mentioned, we have a, a couple of secure um, high-mass neutron star measurements. Yes. Just suppose if we're thinking over the next 10 years, um, make the supposition that higher mass neutron stars are measured, say 2.2, 2.4, 2.6, 2.8. Just, just talk us through quickly what you would learn with a secure mass measurement of ever-increasing value and what will be ruled out in terms of nuclear physics. So if our current understanding of radius measurements in quiescent low mass expert binaries is correct, then there are some neutron stars out there which are, which are low mass and low radius, say 1.1, 1.2-ish solar masses and maybe 10 kilometers. And so then if you, would, you know, if you add an addition to that, a 2.4 solar mass neutron star measurement, that puts you in kind of a pickle or it, it constrains the equation of state mass versus radius curve very, very strongly. And so what you have to do is you have to decrease the pressure at sort of moderate densities so you can match these quiescent low mass X-ray binaries that have low mass and low radius. And then you have to increase the pressure very, very consistently to get to 2.4 solar masses. And so what this, what this actually ends up doing is it takes the mass versus radius curve, I'll try to do it from your perspective, and it goes into low radius and then it goes up and then it actually increases with radius and increasing mass and then it finally hits that 2.4. And so basically that pushes a lot of neutron star radii to larger values. Um, so that's what happens for 2.4. I've done that calculation. Uh, it's, it, that's in our 2013 paper. If you go to 2.8, wow, I, I don't know. That'll be a challenge. That may be interesting. Well, I mean, that's a firm, is that now a firm prediction on the basis of what, what we know about physical possibilities on the map of the neutron cycle on the basis of what we know? Uh, I, I would have to do that calculation more carefully myself. If, if you take the cause, uh, sorry, you take the chiral effective field theory constraint, kind of the upper limit from that as your low, low density, and then you take a causal limit equation of state from there on. Uh, now that I'm being recorded, I'm paranoid, but I believe 3.2 solar masses was the I upper limit. limit yeah. Limit. Well, well, no, well, hers is a combination of nuclear yeah. plus causal, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's very finely tuned, but you can make it work. <clears throat> you mentioned distances and their importance, and I just wanted to say that there will be something like 70 new parallaxes coming out from Gaia within the next no from VLBI. Oh, yeah, that's some great. of those are Fermi sources. Some of them mm -hmm. are, you know, I can't tell you what the the mix is, but there are a fair number of Fermi sources. Yeah, that, that would be wonderful because any, anything you can do to improve these distance measurements uh, will, will help the radius. Uh, just a uh, comment on the quiescent low, uh, low mass X-ray binaries and this distance uncertainty. The work that you sh showed um, ha is kind of on the lower side, and we have some more recent results that um, take this distance uncertainty into account, and you would mo actually move the radii slightly larger, and also the, the surface composition 
the atmosphere composition also moves the radii out larger. So. Yeah, so we, we have included, in, in that particular calculation, we did include the distance uncertainty and the, the atmosphere, the possibility that it might be, for example, helium instead of hydrogen. Uh, in fact, actually, what I would claim is even more important for those particular kinds of objects is the uh, inference of the hydrogen column density and how you handle the X-ray absorption. And so that's made a difference is almost a factor of two in the radius. It's, you know, crazy important. 